Thank you very much, Reverend Jeff, and good evening to my brothers and sisters in Christ and fellow ministers. Glad that we are able to resume our study together. You know, I always look forward for things that needs to share the word as we, you know, endeavor to get the truth from the biblical perspective and not be controlled or enslaved to traditions if the traditions do not match with what the word of God indicates. If, if the tradition matches to the word of God, of course we go with the tradition. We were told in the word about being able to observe the tradition of the elders in relation to what the word of God would project. So Reverend Jeff, I want to say thanks to you for prefacing the remarks by trying to get our, our audience to understand that the attempt it is, is not to mandate or instruct anybody in relation to how they respond to a tradition or, or recommending or suggesting adjustments to tradition that they would have observed. The aim is for us to examine the word and see what the word teaches in relation to things that have been handed down to us and have become established traditions in the church that we have followed for, for many years. And that perhaps to some degree, a large extent of, of Christian churches follow these traditions. But as I indicated previously, it does not necessarily mean that because a majority of people follow a tradition, that that tradition might be founded um, in, in accordance with what the word of God would indicate as the truth. Of course, everybody examines the word and have their different perspectives. And many people believe that they have an understanding of the truth. So we are instructed in the word that we have to study to show ourselves approved of God. Work men that need if not be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. That's a minister's responsibility, yes, but it's also every individual Christian's responsibility to study the word that if anybody questions you in relation to your faith, that's what the Bible says, that we must be able to give an answer. I also instructed as all believers that we have to contend for the faith which was handed down to us, which Jesus would have taught his disciples and which would have been passed on to us um, through the apostolic church. As foundational um, Christian beliefs and principles that, that we practice. So we, ha we have to study to make sure that we are not guided by a tradition, but we are guided by the word of God and ensure that the, our traditions match in their entirety with what the word of God says. So my aim is for us to study together. I do not come from a perspective that I have all the answers or that my particular interpretation is the right one. What I'm trying to show you is that we examine the word together and see what the word is saying to us. And I try to guide you through it in relation to how I have seen that word and have come to understand it and hope that you can see from the particular perspective that I have in relation to what the word of God is saying, or you could have a different perspective and you could show me, hey, you may not have looked at it from this angle, or you may not have seen this particular um, aspect that would, would give more light or clarification. And together we, be, we all become students of the word because we are stronger together following the team, maybe examine the word together, and we each share our light and our understanding. And then we, we all gain from each other's experience, explanations, and understanding because sometimes people see things in, in different ways. And as we examine the Gospels, we will realize that, that even though they're given similar accounts, they have different perspectives and different positions, or give different information, or see things from a different time perspective, and so the accounts sometimes look like they are contradictory or that there are discrepancies. And people challenge the word of God based on those things that they observe um, in, in the word, especially in the New Testament when it comes to the, the timeline given for the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And that is one of the areas that we will have to discuss. We're going to look at some of those apparent contradictions. I know they call them apparent because 
from the way people view them, they might appear to be um, contradictions or discrepancies because they might not see clearly the perspective from which the writers are, are given the information. And we know that reporters can go and view the same event. We see that in, in, in our practical everyday experiences and they report different aspects of the same event or from a, a different point of view or perspective. That's the way um, things work. So what might appear to be a discrepancy or a contradiction is just an, another time period at which the event might have been recorded or a different angle on which it might be given. So that is going to form part of our studies. So I want you from early, I will recommend that you read the gospel accounts, all of them relating to the crucifixion and the resurrection of Jesus. And you will see that you have differences between what the synoptic gospels give and the synoptic gospels refer to Matthew, Mark, and Luke. The reason why they refer to the synoptic gospels is because when, when you study those gospels, you see that they record the similar events and they give a lot of the details that are similar. And in many cases, they even give this, a similar language and word that is used. But John has slight variations and that's why John is not in, included as the a synoptic gospel. So when you hear the term, that's referring to Matthew, Mark and Luke. And the reason for that is because of the harmony and the synergy which they see in those gospels. Now, John historically was the last of the gospels to have been written. There's a debate as to whether it was written before the destruction of the temple in AD 70 or later when John was an older uh, apostle and maybe he would have write, written the, the gospel sometime around um, you know, AD 90 later in, in, in his lifetime. And what is significant to note is that because John is the, is the last of the writers and, and, and records indicate that John would have seen some of the, the accounts recorded by the earlier writers, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. And so what he tries to do is to clarify things to, to give us a better understanding where they might not have given some details. And that's where you will see even more details in the, in the Gospel of John. Or sometimes he's a little more explicit to clarify something that might not have been clear in the earlier Gospels. So that's why you will notice that John expands a little more on things, or sometimes he gives additional information, or he might approach it from a different angle so that we get an overall picture so as to, as to complete the account. And that's why John um, seems so much to vary. For example, you will notice that when it comes to the, the, the crucifixion timeline, John mentions that the day on which Jesus was crucified was called a high day. The, sorry, the day after his crucifixion was called a high day, the Sabbath. That was not mentioned in the other um, writings because he wants us to know that that high day, that Sabbath, is different from the regular seventh day Sabbath, which we will go in a little more detail to understand because the reason why we have come up with the, the Friday crucifixion is because of a misunderstanding and a misinterpretation of that particular Sabbath. So we're going to have to look at some of those details and look for where we get variations in the accounts. So from early, I want you to be checking and you, you note things that you see are discrepancies. And as a student, I want you to try to see if you can give a reconciliation. In other words, if you can explain what you think that the records are different, even though they're dealing with the same event. Well, in some cases, you might hear about two angels and another writer says one. Well, you might hear about three women at the tomb and then you might hear one. So you might hear different things or see different things as, as, the, the, as they're recorded in different gospels. And so that's one thing we will have to examine because people use that to indicate that the Bible is not a creditable document because if you have the same writers writing about similar events and given different accounts, why should we trust that the Bible is inerrant? 
and that we can confide fully in it because we can trust what the records indicate. So that's why we need to look at some of those apart discrepancies or contradictions and get an explanation or understanding of how they can be reconciled because they can be, because the Bible does not contradict itself. And there are very good explanations to the differences that you see. And I hope that this will bring some enlightenment to you because I know that some of you would have already read the accounts in the Gospels and have seen that there are differences. So the series is going to be a, a relatively short series. It's going to well, we plan it for about one month. But according to how the discussion goes and the information that may be necessary for us to expand on or clarify, we could go beyond that. And, you know, it's, it's not a, a problem for me if we have to go a little longer than the, than the scheduled month because I want to make sure that everything is clear and that you are understanding precisely what I'm trying to get you to see from, from the word. So we want to examine the timeline for the Holy Week. We're going to look at the tradition that we have um, been handed down and that most of the churches observed. And I'm going to give you the, the rationale for why they have come up with that particular understanding of the timeline and give you the reasons that they have used for coming to that position. Remember that we are students of the word, we are studying and we have perhaps different perspectives, we come with different backgrounds. And so we interpret things in different ways. But when we study together, I share with you, you share with me, we bounce things from off each other, then we get a clear understanding of what the word is showing us because we want to arrive at the truth. That is what matters, the truth, not the tradition, it's the truth. What we do after we receive the truth is between us and the Holy Spirit giving us direction on how we should function after we have a revelation of what we might believe to be the truth. Because I have said before, the Mormons believe they have the truth. The Jehovah's believe they have the truth. The Adventists believe that their perspective on the Sabbath is the correct war. So, so a lot of denominational groups believe that they have the, the truth based on the particular area that they want to highlight and identify. We believe that we have the truth. But the reality is, is that there can't be different truths. It's one truth. And we need to make adjustments where we need to make adjustments. And we need to be open-minded to see where we might be sticking to a, tra to a tradition rather than observing what the truth is. So we would look at what is the, the, the normal accepted position, which, as I said, has become the tradition. And we know that very often when things become established traditions, that sometimes it appears that the tradition is truth. And especially if a, a large percentage of people accept that tradition, they are more inclined to believe that that particular interpretation or perspective might be right. Then we're also going to look back to when the parcel was established. And we're going to look at the, the tradition that was set in place and the timeline that was indicated um, by God, and we want to look at how that parallels in the life of Christ and in the timeline that we see is identified in relation to the, to the life of Jesus when it comes to the period connected to his crucifixion and his resurrection. So that's how we're going to go um, through the study. And I, and I hope that, you know, you will feel free to share and, and, and don't think as I indicated that I have all the answers and you can't challenge me. I want you to do that, challenge me because as we challenge each other, it, it calls on us then to look deeper and to get a better understanding that we all come to a realization of what we believe the word of God is saying. All right, so the Holy Week then refers to that time period which will start from the entry of Jesus into Jerusalem, which we, we, we call the triumphant entry, which is commonly accepted as Palm Sunday, then to the time which he is believed to have risen 
from the grave. What does I say? He's believed to have risen. The time we believe that he would have entered Jerusalem and the time we believe that he would have risen from the grave. That has come to be accepted as the Holy Week. From Sunday, from Sunday to Sunday, the resurrection. We have Good Friday, which is the commonly accepted tradition related to the time when Jesus was crucified. And he would have taken the Passover with his disciples before he was actually crucified. crucified. And that is what is believed to be referred to as Monday, Thursday. We have Palm Sunday, we have Monday, Thursday, we have Good Friday, and it was established as a Good Friday because of what Jesus would have been accomplishing for us through his death. And then Sunday resurrection, which we refer to as Easter, and, and we're not going to go into an elaborate um, explanation as to the Easter tradition and where that came from and, and all of that. But, but suffice it to say, that the name Easter was connected to uh, a pagan observance where the name changed and, and would refer to as Easter to coincide with the period of time that Jesus would have resurrected, which we would rather say is Resurrection Sunday. But because of the, the, the connection of, of that, that title, we often refer to it now as Easter rather than Resurrection Sunday, which, which will speak in, in greater depth to me, to, to the purpose and, and to the importance. And it would be, it'd be better serving our purpose if we refer to it as Resurrection Sunday rather than Easter Sunday, because that term was not used in the early church. But we will get you know, to a few details in relation to that. But they say the emphasis is not really about the tradition itself, but for us understanding the timeline and how the tradition varies from what perhaps, and I say perhaps because you will have to determine whether you think what we will see in the accounts given in the Gospels would indicate a different timeline to the one that we have traditionally come to accept. Now, why the Friday? The, the, the word indicates that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath. You will see that in, in Mark chapter 16, verse 1. And Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath. The conclusion drawn from that was that that Sabbath was referring to the weekly Sabbath. And the weekly Sabbath traditionally was seen as the Saturday, the seventh day of the week. So if the scriptures indicate that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath, the conclusion was, and the understanding was, of which would be reasonably so if you are not seeing other Sabbaths that were observed and other Sabbaths that the Lord had instructed that the Jews should observe, particularly the Passover Sabbath, which we will look at when we go back to the tradition that was established by God himself. But the understanding was that it was the day before the seventh day Sabbath. My thesis is, is that it, it, it was the day before the Passover Sabbath. And we will have to look and see from the scripture when that Passover Sabbath was. Because it did not coincide with the weekly Sabbath. That's why John chapter 19, I think it's verse 31, refer to it as the high day. It is in parenthesis. It is referred to as the high day, which means it's a special type of Sabbath. It is not the regular Sabbath. And that was his way of identifying to us that it was not a weekly Sabbath that should have been considered. So what the other gospel might have just mentioned, the Sabbath as if it were a regular Sabbath, John indicated that that Sabbath was a high day. And the term high day in the Jewish tradition is recognizing a Sabbath that is not the normal weekly Sabbath. So we have that to go with. All right. Then in John chapter 12, which is a very good point for us to look at the timeline. 
which we will examine in, in, in fairly great detail. And I want to read it for you because having established that Jesus was crucified on the Friday, we now start by looking back at the time period as to when he would have entered Jerusalem, which we would refer to as Palm Sunday. So we could take a glance at St. John chapter 12, because that would give us a very important reference point for how we are going to arrive at the timeline, both in the traditional timeline and the timeline that we believe that the word is indicating. So John chapter 12, reading from the first verse says, then six days before the Passover, so then Jesus, six days before the Passover, came to Bethany. Now we will, we will notice as we go through the Gospels that a lot of reference is being made to the Passover in connection with the crucifixion time. And we have to take that very, very seriously because that is very important in understanding the whole timeline process. It is connected to the Passover. Remember when we were looking at the, the, the whole Christmas tradition, and we were trying to establish the time of Jesus' birth, we said that there was an important connection between the, the, the lamb, which was offered at Passover, and Jesus being the lamb of God. And when we look at the tradition, we, we will see that the lamb was a year old. In other words, that lamb is born at Passover, and that lamb is going to be offered at Passover. The lamb is going to be chosen. Bethlehem was the place where those lambs were raised to be to be then brought to the temple to be offered as the Passover Sabbath. And we use that to, to possibly conclude that those Bible commentators who said Jesus could have been born around the Passover time, the March period, and also crucified around the Passover time, which we can see in a clear indication here from the word that it was Passover when Jesus was crucified. We don't have a, a very clear indication, but it, it's a good extrapolation that we could conclude that he could possibly have been born. When we look at the timeline, we, we are not going back over that now, that he could have been born at, around the, the Passover time, which would fit um, very um, remarkably with the, the, the typology or the allegory of the lamb and Jesus, who is our Passover lamb born on the Passover and die at the Passover, just like the lamb born in the Passover springtime period as the lamb is season, and is going to be killed one year after as the, the sacrificial lamb during the Passover. So we're going to pay very careful attention to how very often the, the term Passover is mentioned in relation to the, that last um, period in Jesus's life. So we know for sure, and there is no doubt um, or discrepancy with the Bible commentators that it was around the Passover time that Jesus was, was um, crucified. And we do not have an issue with the date either. There is no real big debate about the date. Most Bible commentators believe, as the tradition indicates, is that Jesus was crucified on the 14th day of the first month, Nisan, or Abib, A-B-I-B, which is the Jewish name. Nisan was the, the Babylonian name, which they would have gotten from Babylon. Remember, the Jews were done Babylon for a very long time. And so some of their monks carry Babylonian names. Even one of them carried the name Tammuz, which we recognize um, with the, the Babylonian connection. So we would observe that and pay careful attention to how much mention is being made of the Passover and so we're going to have to draw a, a very careful connection with that in relation to the timeline. So then six days before the Passover, then John is saying, Jesus came to Bethany, where Lazarus was, which had been dead, whom he raised from the dead. There they made supper, made him a supper, and Martha served. But Lazarus was one of them that sat at the table with him. And we have the anointing here by Mary, et cetera, et cetera. And then we go on to verse 12. 
Watch this carefully. Verse 12 says, John chapter 12, verse 12. On the next day, much people that were come to the feast, that's the feast of the Passover, people coming down to the feast, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took branches of palm trees. Now again, John is the only one of the writers that mentioned palm trees. If you look back at the Synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, they mention trees or branches. But now John has indicated before now, it's going to give you a little more detail and tell you precisely what type of branches. That's where we get the concept now of, of Palm Sunday. So that would have been derived because John had given us additional information, which would have been missing from the other Gospels, that there were palm trees. So that's how we get the Palm Sunday um, tradition, based on information that John had given us that would not have been recorded other places. So this is one of the areas where you see, as I say, that John sometimes gave additional information. When we look at the Last Supper, we realize that John, I think, is the only one, again, that mentions the foot washing. You don't see the record of it in the Synoptic Gospels, Mark, Luke, and, and um, Matthew. So these are things that we, we want to watch and notice, and that's why John appears to be so different, because he's trying to fill in information that might have been missing from the other records or be a little more explicit. In, in giving us details that help us to understand clearly what the, the word is trying to show. So we are told that six days before the Passover, Jesus came in to Bethany. And in the next day, he went into Jerusalem. And that's where the people lay the palms. And we got Palm Sunday. Now, if you believe that Jesus was crucified on the Friday before the seventh day, the day before the seventh day Sabbath, which is the Friday. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to be slow and precise that you get the timeline. Those persons who believe that Jesus was crucified on the Friday says, okay, now when you come back six days before the Passover, now they will be, they will be, be indicating then that the Passover would have been the day that Jesus was crucified. So they will tell you that that Friday was the 14th day of the first month which, according to the tradition that the Jews observe, will be the Passover. So Jesus was crucified on the Friday, which is the Passover, when the lambs are being slain, because they concluded that the 14th was a Friday. So if you go back six days from Friday, it will carry you to Saturday, which means that Jesus came in to... Um, Bethany on the Saturday, and then the next day, he went into Jerusalem, where the people spread down the palms. That's how they get Palm Sunday. Now, Jesus would have been coming from Jericho. We're going to look a little more when we go into details as to that journey and how long it took. And we're going to look at the timeline from a different perspective. I'm just showing you now the timeline from what the tradition has come to establish. That's how they arrive at Palm Sunday. Six days before the Good Friday, Jesus came into Bethany. He had supper with Martha and Mary and Lazarus. And then the next day, as verse 12 says, he went into Jerusalem where the people laid on the branches. And so you had Palm Sunday. That's how they arrive at the Palm Sunday. So we have then no issue with the 14th. The problem is now is establishing when was the 14th? What day was the 14th of Nisan or the 14th of Abib? And we will also see what should occur on the 14th according to the tradition. We're going to have to pay attention to two significant dates. The 14th of Nisan and the 15th of Nisan, because that will be introducing us to the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. We're going to have also to look in the word as to how those traditions were observed through time. We look through the, the Old Testament 
and see how that Passover was observed because over time, the Jews changed some things about the observance of the Passover. They even changed the, the title that they gave because they merged the Passover with the Feast of Unleavened Bread. And you will realize that uh, sometimes they refer to as the Passover as the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Okay, and I will explain to you how those merge and what also could, could cause some issues in interpretation in relation to the timing of Jesus's um, crucifixion. Okay, so you then will understand why Good Friday. Good Friday, because they believe that it was the, the, the day before the weekly Sabbath that Jesus was crucified because the, the account indicates in the, the gospel that Jesus was crucified the day before the Sabbath. And that he would have had um, supper with his disciples the night before he was crucified. So if he was crucified the Friday and he had supper with the disciples and he went to the Garden of Gethsemane with them where he was arrested, all of that would have happened on Thursday. The night which he, he had supper with the disciples, which as I said, we refer to as Monday, Thursday. So some people do their foot washing on Monday, Thursday. Coming back from Good Friday to fit, fit in with the timeline given to us by John, six days before the Passover, came Jesus to Bethany and had supper. They said that that would have been a Saturday. And then Jesus went into Jerusalem the following day, which will take you to Palm Sunday. All right. Now, I, I, I want to also give you another reason why people think highly of, of Friday as the crucifixion day. Now, remember, we're going to be applying all the principles that we have learned um, from our previous dialogue because they're necessary. Every time we are studying the word, we apply principles. We will have to look for passages of scripture that harmonize, deal with the same topic, and look for all the information that is given in relation to that same incident or same event. We also have to look at historical data which is given in the word. And we also look at extra biblical information which might not be given in the word but bears relevance to what we are trying to understand or interpret from the word. So we're going to still be applying these principles. Now, the Bible indicates to us that Jesus was taken before Pilate to be tried, which means that Jesus' crucifixion would have to have taken place when Pilate was reigning as a governor, as a Roman governor, it would have to be. As if he was taken to Pilate to be, to be tried and to be sentenced, and Pilate wouldn't want to have anything to do with it because they, they had this belief in an omen that if you kill an innocent man or a, or a just man, it could bring a bad omen on your life. And that's why Pilate's wife was trying to tell him, be careful how you deal with the just man. Because of that belief that they had, that if, if you were on fear to a just man, it could bring a bad omen in your life. So we understand that why Pilate really didn't want to have anything to do with that decision. He washed his hands clean and tell the people I'm going to offer him to you, you do what you want to do, but his blood is not going to be on me because he does not want any bad or men to fall on, on him. So we know then that Jesus' crucifixion was connected to the reign of, of Pontius Pilate, sometimes referred to as Pontius Pilate. Now, history indicates that he reigned um, from about a 10 year period. 26 to 36 AD, which means that if you're looking for a timeline in terms of the year for Jesus' crucifixion, it has to be between 26 and 36 AD. Now, that is not going to form the main part of our contention. But the reason why I introduced that is because there have been astronomical dating in relation 
to the to the year that Jesus would have been crucified. And those astronomical um, that astronomical research indicates that between that period, 26 and 36 AD, there were only two times that the 14th of Nisan occurred on a Friday. All right? Remember, there's no problem with the 14th day of Nisan. Almost all the commentators agree that Jesus was crucified on the 14th of Nisan. So having no check, the astronomical research and, and data indicates that you have two periods between 26 AD and 36 AD when Pontius Pilate was ruling and when Jesus could have been crucified, and that you had two Fridays that occurred on the 14th day of Nisan that give a strong um, a, a, a indication to those folks that, hey, we could have something here going. We got astronomical data to indicate that Jesus was crucified on a Friday, and we found two dates in that period which occurred on a Friday. That was AD 33. And people say that Jesus could have been crucified in AD 33 on the 7th of April. The people have gotten that specific going back to researching information. And then um, there's, there's another group that indicates he could be crucified on the 7th, or, sorry, the 3rd of April, AD 33, or the 7th of April, AD 30, because you're between 26 and 36. And then you got the reign of Tiberius Caesar, which will give you a little more precision as to when Jesus had been crucified the year. Now, note here carefully that even that astronomical research still has a, a difference. It is not conclusive, but they give a time period. So I indicate that to let you know that that is one of, of the, the pieces of information that those people who believe that that Good Friday would have been the 14th day, will hold on to that and say, yes, the, the astronomical information indicates that that is what could have been the case. So you had the day before the Sabbath, let's just say the seventh day Sabbath. So we don't have any problem in saying that it was a Friday. We have some data in here from uh, records in astronomical chronology, which indicates that yes, it could have been possibly a Friday. We also have some uh, indication from what John said. And if we check back from Friday, we could draw the conclusion that Jesus entered on Palm Sunday and he was crucified on the Friday and he rose on the Sunday. Now, I will discuss a few issues that we, we will have with these particular time periods. And then I will pause to see if you have any questions or any interjections or anything that, that puzzles you that you want us to consider or introduce into the discussion that we get information before we begin to look at what God has established as the timeline and how that is going to be connected to Christ. Now, bear in mind that the scripture indicates and this is indicated in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. I'm going to let us turn to that because that's a very important verse that we must look at. Matthew chapter 12, verse 40. And we're looking at some issues that we will have now looking at the traditional time, timing as Jesus being crucified on the Friday. Jesus says here, Matthew chapter 12, 40, for as Jonah was three days and three nights in the whale's belly, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Why are we going to have to take that seriously? Because it is coming from Jesus. What else is significant about that? Let's read a few verses earlier on, from verse 38. Then certain of the scribes and of the Pharisees answered, saying, Master, we will see a sign from thee. We want a sign from you. Are you already the Messiah? Are you already who you say you are? We want a sign. But he answered and said unto them, An evil and adulterous generation seeketh after a sign. 
watch this, and there shall be no sign given to it but the sign of the prophet Jonah. And then Jesus said, for as Jonah was in the, in, the, in the belly of the whale three days and three nights, so the son of man shall be in the belly of the, of the earth three days and three nights. Now, what is that significant? That is significant because Jesus gave that as an important sign and an indicator that he is who he says he is, that he is the Messiah. And that the, and, and that the tangible proof, you want a sign? That's the sign that is going to be given. I am going to lay down my life and take it up in three days. My crucifixion and my resurrection is going to be the sign that you need that will indicate that I'm a Messiah. I am the Messiah, sorry. So you are seeing the miracles. You are seeing a lot of things that Jesus um, have done. But, but, but that, those particular events are critical. And that's why Paul said the resurrection and I believe he would be also thinking about the crucifixion because he had to die first before he rose. He said the foundation of Christianity is based on, on those events. And if it wasn't for those events, we could shut shop because we won't have any basis for identifying really tangibly the solid evidence that Jesus is God, the Messiah. And Jesus himself says, this is the sign. So we have to take that sign literally, and we have to take the time reference significantly. So if we say that Jesus was crucified on Friday and rose on Sunday morning, it is not going to match with what Jesus says here. And since it is an important sign, we have to take that sign seriously, three days and three nights. Now, I heard a, a, a discussion on on the radio some years ago, where people were calling in, and they usually had ministers um, on that particular calling program discussing, you know, church issues and, and, and things that, that people have questions about. And a person called in and says, well, you people say the Bible is so accurate and so precise and so reliable, and it doesn't make mistakes. But you say to us from that Bible, that Jesus was crucified on a Friday and he rose on a Sunday. And Jesus himself said that he was going to be in the earth three days and three nights. How do you get three days and three nights on Friday evening to Sunday morning? That cannot add up. And the ministers on that program didn't have an answer to give to those people at all. The reason why they didn't have any answer because they were challenged to explain how you're going to arrive at that. Some people hinted, well, you know, the Jews could consider part of a day as a full day. So you could get part of each of these days that could still add up to three days and three nights. No, that is a weak argument and you can't use it because what you're going to be doing, going back to the account that you are going to be looking at, and I believe some of you are familiar with, Jesus was crucified and taken down on the cross before the Sabbath began. So he was on the cross and darkness covered the earth, but he was crucified at, at, at nine. And the Bible says from 12 to three, there was darkness on the earth and Jesus gave up the ghost at three o'clock. So he died at three o'clock. Again, this is significant. You will see that later but they have to get it buried before six o'clock because you're going into the Sabbath and you can't be dealing with dead people on the Sabbath because that is going to be as, as, as viewed as contamination and you'll be rendered unclean. And if you're observing a Passover, you can't be observing a Passover in an unclean condition. So they have to get him down from the cross. So you are going to make a whole day out of three hours from three o'clock to six. Then you have a full day Saturday, but then you're going to have to make another, another full day because Jesus is going to be resurrected according to tradition early Sunday morning. And where are you going to do that? Make a three hour period, which is one eighth of a, of a full 24 hour day, you're going to make that a whole day. And then you're going to take another part of the, of, the, of the Sunday and make that a whole day and miss out a large section of the day just 
to be able to, to, to um, satisfy people's inquis in inquisition about how do you get three days and three nights from Friday to, to Sunday? You can't get it. And the reason why we don't need to have to try to justify it is because, as I said, when we look at the account given in the Bible, we don't have to try to justify that because precisely as Jesus said, he would be in the grave three days and three nights. And when we look at the timeline, we're going to see how that would have occurred. So that's, that's one uh, issue that you will have with looking at, at that particular timeline. Now, again, a problem that you're going to have if you use that as an argument is, so when you read about time in the Bible, how, how then will you be able to, to conclude that you have a full day? So that when God told Moses that he's going to come down on, on, the, on the mountain in three days' time to sanctify the people, how do you measure those three days? Are those three full days or parts of days? How do you measure Moses up in the, in the mountain for 40 days and 40 nights? Are those part of days? How do you measure Jesus in the wilderness fasting for 40 days and 40 nights. Are those part of days or are they full days? How do you measure the flood time? So you're going to have a problem of indicating, well, if you're going to use that as an argument, well, how then do we come to an understanding of what is a full day? Now, the Jews had a way of, of getting around any doubt as to when they mean a 24 hour period, in case you want to use an argument that, hey, you can, you can get part of a day to represent a whole day. You, you might, 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 might be able to do that, but that's not the common practice. And you don't, you don't see any evidence of that or much evidence of that indicated as you study timelines in the Bible. But when you see three days and three nights mentioned, whenever you see day and night attached to a numerical value, that was the way that those Jews guaranteed that we are dealing with a 24 hour period. So when Jesus was in the, in the, in the wilderness, 40 days and 40 nights, and we sing the song around the length time, it was 40 days and 40 nights, full 24 hour periods. When Jesus says that he was going to be in the grave three days and three nights, that is to remove any uncertainty that we are dealing with any part of a day and part of a night. Because Jonah was actually in the belly of the whale three days and three nights. If you read Jonah, and Jesus is pulling that analogy into what he's saying to us is the sign that he's going to give to the Pharisees to indicate that he is, is the Messiah. Three days and three nights. So that's what we have to work with. When we come to look at the other timelines that are indicated, because remember, we are looking at different positions and different perspectives. And then we will draw a conclusion as to what we believe the word is showing or indicating to us. As I said, it's, it's not to try to, 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 to get you to feel that, you know, I'm trying to compel you to change whether you celebrate Good Friday or not, or you celebrate um, Monday, Thursday or not. That is not what I'm trying to do. Now, I, as I said, I read, I understand, and I make my adjustments to suit what I believe the Spirit is saying to me. So we are not trying to, to debate that here. We are just trying to examine the word as students to see what the Bible is, is saying to us. So I've shown you the tradition, the Holy Week, which is also referred as Passion Week, how it has been arrived at, and the evidence that they use to help them form their conclusions. I'm going to briefly recap them, and then I'm going to pause to see if you have any queries, any comments, or anything you want us to check, anything you have researched and you want to put in here that we can analyze and discuss as we go through our series, sure. And then we can proceed to, to, to look at um, some other things which we want to, to bring into the, the discussion. So Friday, the day before the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath, was the conclusion as to the day that Jesus was crucified. Monday, ter Monday, Mon Monday Thursday would have been the day that he would have had the Last Supper 
with his disciples. Palm Sunday would have been the, the day that he went into Jerusalem and had the palm leaves laid, and that's why we have used the term Palm Sunday. And following on from the timeline given by John, which is very critical because we will come back to that when we look at other timelines suggested how that plays significant. Um, that six days before the Passover, Jesus came into Bethany, having come from Jericho, and he would have traveled about what? About 15 miles coming from Jericho to Jerusalem. And, 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 and if you remember the, the Good Samaritan account, that's a road that people used to traverse, Jerusalem to Jericho. It's a very dangerous road. So Jesus would have been traveling through the daytime so that he could arrive in the evening time um, in Bethany, had supper because he would have been really, really tired, and Mary and Martha, in their gratitude, prepared a good supper for Jesus. And the, the word indicates in John chapter 12, verse 12, that the next day he went in to um, Jerusalem. So since the conclusion that was that he arrived this Saturday, he went into Jerusalem the following day. That would have been a, a, a Sunday. That's how he arrived at Palm Sunday. And so that's the conclusion that was drawn. And that's the timeline that has been traditionally observed and followed. That we have been part of, I have been part of, but studies have indicated to me that it, it is not matching, it is not in harmony with what the word of God says. I have gone over these gospels over and over and over, fine tuned and given some fine details. And you will see when we go through the account, the, 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 the meticulous way in, in which I have gone through some of these, because really I think when God established a timeline is significant. And sometimes we are inclined to say, well, you know, Jesus died anyhow, and he rose anyway, so this is not important. No, it is. It is important because the truth is important. And if, and if God established a timeline for a purpose to be a prototype in the life of Jesus Christ, we have to take that as significant and, and don't undervalue um, what God might have established because, you know, we might not want to make um, an adjustment to how we have come to understand something. And I, I don't like to hear people say that it doesn't matter. Well, you know, Jesus was born anyhow, so it doesn't matter that we celebrate his birth on December, any other day, or that he was crucified anyhow. So it doesn't matter whether it's Good Friday or it's a Wednesday, it doesn't matter. No, it matters because truth matters. Because as it indicate to you, a lot of Bible critics are using some of these um, discrepancies or what appear to be contradictions to, to say to us that your Bible has issues. It has problems. And if you can't get this reconciled, why should I trust that as the inerrant word of God? And you want to tell me that I have to, to trust my life to that and what it says when there are issues and problems with it. So I'm saying that there are answers and there are solutions and that we just need to be studious and give the answers to show people that the Bible is true and can be trusted. So we are about truth. And I pause here. So you have a, a, a lot to, to mull over, um, to reflect on, and talk to me, because they say we are, we are in a discussion. We, we are sharing the word together. We're going to examine it together in detail. So I'll show you John chapter 12. I'll show you Matthew chapter um, 12, verse 40. And I mentioned John talking about the Sabbath was a high Sabbath. And I'll show you some of the reasons why people conclude on the Friday and some of the, um, the difficulties that we will have to encounter in dealing with it if we accept that position. So talk to me. I pause. Good night, Pastor. Jackman, how are you doing? Yes, I'm good, Wendell. Yes, please. Yes, please. Yeah, so we have some, it's a, it's a very good study, Pastor, and I think one of the things that many persons fail to recognize is that there were many Sabbaths. Yes. 
You have the Day of Atonement, that was the Holy Convocation. That's right. Looking the word, I thought that was a Sabbath. You have the new moons and that kind of stuff, Sabbath. Yeah. Yes. And dealing with the Passover now, you have you have uh, another Sabbath as well, and which will put Jesus being crucified really on the on the Wednesday. Yeah. Right. So right. The, the truth is that I know we have the traditions and we have what we come along doing for all these years. And I know that it's something that will be difficult for people to 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 adapt and change to, but Again, as you said earlier, we have to be students of the word and go with what the Bible is saying. And when the Bible makes something clear, as a matter of fact, the Bible says in Acts that in times of ignorance, God will act. Yes. So, so now if we come to the realization that what we have as the Sabbath wasn't really the Friday, sorry, wasn't really the... Saturday Sabbath. Right, right. Sabbath. right. Right. Once we get that understanding now, then I think we should look at it and 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 try our best to fit with what the word is saying now for all these years we have gone to church and i think the things that we took for granted yeah and and they get in our dna they get in our system and we find it difficult to break them but men like our air tory men like william barclay these are men that really opened my eyes and showed me too as well that christ cannot have been crucified on the friday right correct I know yeah. the argument. I listen to many like John Maxwell, good man too. And John Maxwell had the same view of, of um, um, a part of a day being a whole day. Yeah. And I had that view too because I normally say that a day's pay or a day's wage is not a 24 hour payment. You work for eight hours or however long you work, but that's still considered a day's pay. That's yeah. if you were had. That's if you were had. But again, okay. look at. But, but again, looking at it, looking at it for real, I guess we have to see and study because you go back now to, book, to um, Exodus and Leviticus and they show you all these different Sabbaths that they had. And Christ had to be crucified. The 14th was always the day for the Passover killing. Right? Yeah. That was, that, 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 was that, that, that's in stone. That's in stone. And we have to find out where, when, when that was. Right. And once we find out when that, when that was, then we yeah. write on the nail. We write on the nail. That's right. Yes, please. That's my contribution, Pastor. Thank you very much. Very You're good welcome. contribution. But I, I didn't read much from Barclay, but I have studied Tori um, intensely. I, and interestingly enough, Tori was not the first person that, that opened um, my, my zeal to do some research on this area. Interestingly enough, it was a person that we would, would, would think that have uh, issues with 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 on the exposition on the word. That's the Herbert um, W. Armstrong from the World Tomorrow. He was the first person I heard in relation to the the Wednesday crucifixion, and that led me to start doing some research. And and, and in my research, I came up on uh, R. A. Tory, who is a who is a, is a very good expositor, and he wrote the book Difficulties of the Bible, and he attempts to explain a whole number of other things that people question about the Bible. Like, like, um, King Kenan Abel and went to the land of Nod and Murray and who he married and all those things. And he he gave a very good explanation of things that people question in the Bible. And I think that's what we have to do as, as students because if people question the authenticity and the authority of the Bible, we have issues. If they can justify their claim to the, the, um, the inerrancy of the word, so the errancy, if they are saying it is error, we are saying it is inerrant. And they can show from the arguments. Then it shakes our foundation because of what of, a lot of what we believe and stand for is based on what we read in the Bible. I have come to accept and believe as the word of God, as revealed, and we trust that. So if we trust it, we have to have the right understanding of it. So the reason why you will have the problem with the, the part, then the part, like, is because the Bible does not say that, that that's how it was calculated. That's what people conclude. But there's nothing around the crucifixion of Jesus that, that says to us that that is how it should be interpreted. And furthermore, we, we have very justified reasons to indicate that it could be a different day. That's all I'm saying. My aim is to go through the word and let you conclude for yourself if that makes sense. Uh, if it yeah. looks like truth. And yes, can be accepted as the truth. 
that's that's the position. But the thing is too, right? Once, once you have a bad view, Pastor, you have to make it right based on, for instance, Jesus said three days and three nights. Yes. You know, if you have the, the, the Friday as the day, you can't do anything on Saturday. You have to make now your theology fit those three days and three nights. So you have to find you gotta find somewhere of bending it and twisting it to make sure that that same time span that Christ said that he would be in the, the, the belly of the of the ground. You have to yes. make that fit in between Friday and Sunday. You have to do it. Right. And that <laughs> and that's what that and that's sorry the cross, that's what you call an a priori position. Mm -hmm. And that's what people who believe in evolution, they come from an a priori position. In other words, they say evolution is true. And they wriggle a whole lot of arguments around that to, to justify their position and to make Darwinism look right because mm -hmm. they start from that position. So if you start from that position, uh, a priori position, you have determined it is Friday. You now have to try to justify why it is that. And you have to do a whole lot of gerrymandering to come up with that solution. And, and we shouldn't do that when it comes to the word of God. Because while I, I quoted the astronomy, you can look at other astro astronomical um, um, indications, which I will show you, that could also come up with a different day. So while you could have found that the 14th of, of Nissan occurred two Fridays in between AD 26 and AD 36, why don't you check to see that you could also find that you can get um, a Wednesday as the 14th of Nissan as well. All right, so we want some other folks. Yes, I was about to go a comment. Oh, and Randall mentioned that about the different, um, he mentioned about the different Sabbaths, right? And yes. one thing you have to consider then would be appropriate knowledge of Jewish tradition. Because I'm here looking now at the whole idea where there was um, the difference between Passover uh -huh. uh, then the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Right. Which would each have their own Sabbaths involved in there. Yes. And, and those would then go and... Yeah, and we, will talk, yeah we will talk about that because that is, that is critical. Because mm -hmm. we, we, we need to understand that even when God established a tradition, the Jews ended up changing and adjusting that tradition as well. And that's why they, 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 they used the Feast of Unleavened Bread and the Passover as if they were one in the same. And, and, and sometimes you have the 15th and the 14th being mixed up and into um, the 20th in, in that whole um, changing of tradition. So that's why, as I said, we need to establish first of all what God said. And I will show you a number of other references in the Bible where that tradition of the 14th day being observed as the Passover was what was the common practice. But when Jesus came on the scene, there were things that, that had changed by that time. So we need to, to determine then which we are going to be looking at, the 14th day as the Passover or the 15th day as the Passover. And we'll see how John helps us to understand the difference between the 14th and the 15th and other the, um, writings as well from the Synoptic Gospels. It's very important. And that's the type of detailed way in which you have to look at the scripture in order to be able to come away with the truth. And when you do that, you will find it because the word promises that if you seek the whole heart, you will find. And if you're diligent to find truth, the Holy Spirit is there to reveal truth to us once we are diligent um, seekers of that truth. And, and I believe that we will discover a lot of things as we go through this short series that perhaps some of us may not have known or seen observed before because we, we did not do that sort of detailed um, study. So that's why I think it's important we go through it together and I, I show you from the scripture what the word is saying. Then you conclude where you think that that is something that we can depend on as the truth. Or we still have to, to, to hold on to the traditional perspective. Thank you very much for, for that mention because that is something that is going to come up in our, in our dialogue. And I'll, I'll show you a timeline where people start with the 15th as the Passover. And I'll show you a timeline where they start with the 14th as the Passover. And in neither one of those timelines will you come up with a Friday. As a matter of fact, both of those timelines still end up 
on Wednesday as the crucifixion. Interestingly enough, you can check from the 14th and go to, to what John tells us at six days before the Passover, or you can start from the 15th and you will, you will still end up on Wednesday. And it's interesting to see how that could happen. And not Friday, in none of those timelines will you come to Friday as the day on which Jesus was crucified. All right, any more comments or observations? We, we have 15 minutes. If not, I will introduce you to a passage which I will want you to, to, to go home and, 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 and personally study because that is the establishment that we have from the Old Testament of when the Passover established and see how it is going to connect with Jesus. How was Paul indicates in Corinthians that Jesus is our Passover? Why did he use that term? Significant. All right, let's look at Exodus chapter 12. So now we start to establish now what God has established. That's what we're going to look at. We just look at the tradition that we have come along with and that we have all lived through and still today observed it, are taught it, and we hear it all over the place. Palm Sunday, Monday, Thursday, Good Friday, Easter morning, Sunday. All right, now let's see what God says. Exodus chapter 12. Reading from verse 1. And the Lord spake unto Moses, and I hope you bring along your Bibles with you, because we could post, post some, some verses on, on, the, on the screen, but I want you to move with your Bible so that you can, you can underline passages, highlight them, and go back to them, because they're very, very significant, and I want you to, do, to, to get any habit of doing that. If you look at my Bible, it's all marked up, highlighted and written in it, because there are things there that you can go back to easily. And the Lord spake unto Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, saying, This month shall be unto you the beginning of months. It shall be the first month of the year to you. Now, I didn't say that. The Jews didn't come up with that. God said to them that that month is going to start their calendar. And that's where the Jews would have started their calendar. Nisan the first month of the year, or Abib. Speak ye unto all the congregation of Israel, saying, In the tenth day of this month, watch what, what, the timeline, and God establishing this. In the tenth day of this month, they shall take to them every man a lamb, according to the house of their fathers, a lamb for a house. In the first month, we got it, and on the tenth of that month, Two time periods here set by God. If a household be too little for the lamb, let him and his neighbor next on his house take it according to the number of the souls. Every man, according to his eating, shall make your account for the lamb. So you, you could take a lamb for a household. That will reduce the number of lambs that you have to slay. Your lamb shall be without blemish. Jesus, spotless lamb of God. Male. A female, you're not going to get a female goat or female lamb. It's a male because it's a male that is going to be sacrificed as the lamb for our sin. A male of the first year, the first yearling lamb. And as I said, that was the significant play we had between Jesus' birth and, and, and his crucifixion. First, first they born and, and in the springtime, crucified in the springtime, born at Passover. And, and some people say that that's the reason why the tents and the inns were filled when Mary and Joseph were traveling because it was a Passover and, and hundreds and hundreds of Jews all over the place are moving to Jerusalem for the Passover and the inns were occupied with travelers. And Mary and Joseph couldn't find any room because chances are they were traveling on the Passover heading to Jerusalem. You shall take out from the sheep or from the goats. 
you shall keep it until the 14th day of the same month. So it's the first month of the year, Nisan or Abin. On the 10th of that month, you are going to select your lamb. And you are going to keep that lamb until the 14th day. So that lamb has to be kept for until the 14th day. For four days, you are going to be holding that lamb. The whole assembly and the congregation shall kill it in the evening. So there, there, is, there, there is debate now among the, 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 the modern day Jews as to whether the lamb was to be killed on the morning of the 14th or of the evening of the 14th going in to the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which would have been the 15th. Now, God clearly indicates here that the lamb is going to be killed in the evening. The evening time cannot be the same as the morning time. It's evening. They shall take of the blood and strike it on the two door posts and the upper, etc. etc. We don't need to read all those details. They shall eat, eat the flesh in the night, roast with fire and unleavened bread with bitter herbs. They shall eat it. So the lamb is going to be killed in the evening. It's the same time. It's between three o'clock and six o'clock that you are going to have to kill this lamb. That is the evening time. Jesus died exactly at three o'clock. He gave up the ghost. The same time at which they will be beginning to slaughter the lambs that are going to be roasted in the night time and they're going to eat it with bitter herbs and unleavened bread. That will introduce now to the feast of unleavened bread, which will start after sunset. Bear in mind that the Jews' day is not like the Roman day. And that's one of the differences that we will see between John and the Synodic Gospels. Very often, John was was given time as Roman time and where people got confused is they did not realize that the time given in Matthew, Luke and Mark was, was Jewish time and we'll, we'll show you that when you get to those points in relation to Jewish fiction that where people think it was an error or it's a discrepancy it was really that John was dealing with Roman time because at the time that he was writing that was the, the significant time as distinct from when Mark, Luke and, and Matthew wrote where they were given um, the Jewish time. So it means here then that the Feast of Unleavened Bread will start after sunset. Or as the Jews will say, when the first three stars appear in the sky, the 14th is ended, and you now begin the 15th, which starts from the night time. So that's why we would have to understand when we come to the crucifixion of Jesus, that Jesus had his supper in the evening. He, he took the path over in the evening because he knew that he was going to die the next day. So he could not have taken the path over at the same time the Jews would have been eating the, uh, the, the lamb and on leavened bread because he's not going to be around on the 15th. He is going to die on the 14th. So we have the, the timeline set here. And go down to verse 14. It says, and this day shall be unto you for a memorial. And you shall keep it, the feast to the Lord throughout your generations. You shall keep it a feast by an ordinance forever. Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread. Even the first day you shall put away leaven out of your house. This is tradition. You've got to get the leaven out of your house before the, 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 um, the sun comes up the next day. For whosoever eateth unleavened bread from the first day until the seventh day, that sword shall be cut off from Israel. Serious. And in the first day, watch this carefully, there shall be a holy convocation. And in the seventh day, there shall be a holy convocation to you. So the feast of unleavened bread is a seven-day feast, which starts on the 15th. The first day, it's going to be a holy convocation. That's a Sabbath, folks. It says you shall not do any work. No manner of work shall be done in them, save that every man must eat. That is the only thing that may be done of you. That's what the word of God is saying. So the first day of unleavened bread, which is the 15th, 
and the seventh day, which is the ending of the feast, is also going to be a Sabbath. That's another Sabbath in there. Whatever day they fall on, whatever day they fall on, it has nothing to do with the seventh day Sabbath. The first day of the Feast of Unleavened Bread is a Saturday, is a Sabbath, sorry. So that when you see John mentioning that, that the day that Jesus was crucified before, he called the preparation day. Now people argue that Friday is also the preparation day. But if you watch the tradition, you will watch all the Gospels mention that the day on which Jesus was crucified was called the preparation day. And it was not a Friday. It was called the preparation of the Passover because that's when they prepared the lamb. They killed the lamb and they prepared the lamb to be eaten in the night time. So they invited the morning break out on the 15th of 11 bread. Remember the day started from the night time. So from the time the sun set, those people were eating bread, eating the, um, the bitter herbs on leaven bread and, and eating the roast, the roast lamb. Now I want you also to look at a significant verse here. In verse 46. Still at Exodus 12, 46. In one house shall it be eaten. Thou shalt not carry forth or out of the flesh abroad out of the house. Watch this carefully. Neither shall he break a bone thereof. That is significant again. So I want you to see that this, this tradition here is establishing a parallel or a prototype which is going to be fulfilled in the life of Jesus. He is the lamb without spot or blemish. A firstling, a, a, a lamb of the first year, a male. He is going to be selected on the 10th of the month. He is going to be kept until the 14th of the month when he will be killed. So as I said earlier, Nobody questions that Jesus was crucified on the 14th. The issue is what day it was. Now, we have here from the, the, the indication is that the day following the crucifixion was a Sabbath. So if Jesus is the Passover lamb being killed on the 14th to correspond with when the Jews are killing their lamb to roast it and eat it for the Feast of Unleavened Bread, which is going to be a Sabbath that follows, since I am saying to you unequivocally that that is the Sabbath before which Jesus was crucified. And that is where the early traditional interpreters made the mistake and concluded that it was the day before the seventh day Sabbath. This is a clear indication here that it was the day before the Passover Sabbath. 14th of Nisan is when it was referred to as the preparation day or the preparation of the Passover. They are killing the lamb and preparing it to be eaten on the feast day, which starts the following day from the evening time on the 15th day of the month. And the word here says it is a Sabbath day. It's a holy convocation and nobody can do any work, meaning it's a Sabbath. That is the Sabbath before which Jesus was crucified. Now, as we proceed now, we will show you how the timeline unfolds. I will show you other passages that speak about the 14th day as the day that the lamb was killed. And I'm going to show you from a little further down in the Old Testament, how it was observed by Joshua and by Josiah. They kept the 14th day. God allowed for the tradition to change if a person was unclean, that he would be allowed to celebrate it. Um, on another occasion, I will show you that. But the tradition established was it was to be the 14th day that the lamb was to be prepared and eaten from sunset at the beginning of the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So I pause there again. We have two minutes. If you want to comment, if that clarifies anything for you, if you agree or disagree with me, because that's where I draw my conclusion from, that it was the Passover Sabbath, which was not the seventh day Sabbath, and therefore it could not have been a Friday, even though the Friday people say that Friday was the Passover. 
and I'm going to show you how that could not be from the scripture. Yes, Pastor, again. Yes. Now, Jesus, Jesus is the fulfillment of Passover. He is. So he couldn't have eaten. Normally, he would have eaten the Passover just with the Jews. But he had to eat the, he had, he had to eat the Passover before because he is now going to be fulfillment of this lamb that's going to be slain. Correct. So when he ate, when he ate with the disciples, the next day he was a dead man. Because yep. he cannot fulfill the 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 um the the to, to be the true the true the true Passover. So it is really adding up that the fourteenth. You can't argue with the fourteenth because that's that's right there anyway. But clear, clear, clear. You can't, you're right. You can't argue with that. So that's a given point. So we got to start from there and go forward. Correct. Yes, please. We've got we've got to start from there and build the 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 um the timeline, build the tradition, build the parallel. Mm -hmm. Which means that Jesus knew that he was not going to be around to eat the, the lamb and the unleavened bread at the normal time of the 15th, Correct. which would have been the Thursday, mm -hmm. because he would have been dead. Correct. So he had to eat it earlier. So mm -hmm. that washing and that eating of the Last Supper took place on the Wednesday night, which is still the 14th. Because remember, the night comes before the day. So Jesus is going to eat with his disciples the, that, that evening. They're going to sing, as indicated by John. And John gave a lot of details. Then they're going to move out to the Garden of Gethsemane. He's going to be arrested in the night time of the rains. And like, don't forget that. Sherry early in the morning to Pilate and all about the place, the Caiaphas and, and, and those for the trial. All of that time is now Wednesday day time. He's going to be killed on the sixth hour. On the third hour, which is 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 um about nine o'clock, and he's going to be on the cross from twelve till three, where he gives up the ghost at three o'clock, still Wednesday evening. But we have to get him down because by the time you turn six o'clock, after that you go into the Passover Sabbath. You cannot be dealing with any dead bodies, so they have to hurry Jesus down. And and the part I showed just now. They're not breaking a bone. That's why Jesus' bones was not broken. And the other thieves on the cross, they broke their legs because they were not dead yet. But Jesus gave up the ghost at three o'clock. He was dead. So when they went to check Jesus, he was already dead. So then they're going to break his feet. They pierced his side with the sword because the scripture had indicated his feet were not to be broken in this parallel here. You can't break the lamb's feet. And it's going to be shown in another part of the scripture. All right, it's nine o'clock. So that would be our first session for tonight. But if you have, you know, a, a little question or comment before we close off, you can do that. But it's nine o'clock. It's our close off time. So that's it from me tonight. So I think your 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 understanding, I hope, is beginning to open and you're beginning to get some light. And there's more light to come, folks. Don't miss the sessions. Invite a friend in. Invite another brother or sister. Let's study together. We are stronger when we do it together. We're going to get a better understanding. In Jesus' name, amen from me.